Hello everybody. I was given the great honour to partner with the National Gallery for their 200th anniversary and interpret the artworks in my own way. So, of course I had to recreate an outfit, and I chose Mr William Hallett from The Morning Walk, painted in 1785 by the great Georgian portrait artist Thomas Gainsborough. Gainsborough is one of the premier Georgian portrait artists along with Reynolds and Zoffany. Gainsborough has a very poetic style with lighter brushwork, almost akin to Impressionism and the work of Van Dyck. This style of artwork, of course, is less about specific detail in clothing and more about a feeling and interpretation of dress. This, despite being gorgeous, can make recreating fashion from his artwork slightly challenging. The National Gallery puts Mr. Hallett in a black silk velvet ensemble. However, I'm not so sure this is what Mr. Hallett is wearing. It just doesn't scan for me or sit with the fashions of the day, and neither do I think the lovely couple are wearing their wedding outfits. Controversial, I know. And after all, unless you're royal, there wasn't much of a tradition in being painted in your wedding clothes in society at this point. They're a young couple in very fashionable clothing, and everything very much points towards the year 1785. And, as you can see from other portraits of the time, we are really moving into the period of the dark blue coat with brass buttons. So I think that's what he's wearing. And if you see the painting in situ in the gallery, the coat isn't black, especially when compared with the breeches. Now, the breeches, I also think, are probably a very nice light wool as opposed to a silk velvet. So this is where I'm going with it. In terms of Gainsborough interpreting his own sitters, I'm going to interpret Gainsborough. Therefore, in order to construct the coat, I will be using a dark blue wool superfine. This is a wool made in the same way and with the same kind of specifications as wool would have been in the 18th century from Koshin and Phillips who I'll be linking below. And here we have a nice kind of sped up piece with some lovely ASMR of the tailoring process. The real art of tailoring for this period is in the cut. The 1780s is an extremely transitional period as you move from the lower waists of the earlier 18th century into the really high waists of the latter 18th century and into the 19th century. This means that this period tends to be an interesting cacophony of styles from wider backs, smaller backs, higher waists, lower waists. There doesn't seem to be an overall arc. And then, of course, cutting things rather well, you leave little wastage. Now, going back to a coat I examined some years ago, it gave me an idea about the pocket shape. Rather than the traditional scalloped shape, which you tend to see earlier in the century, I decided to go for this nice, curved, more sort of reserved English-style pocket, which is just simply curved and utilitarian. And, of course, I'm using offcuts for it, which is completely period, because, of course, piecing is period, and using as much of your fabric as possible is incredibly period. As I was planning out the coat, I thought to myself, and back to the garment I'd examined before, which was from the 1780s, thinking, oh, I could add an interesting lining. So that's exactly what I've done. 
The main form of interfacing and structure in the 18th century would have been a heavyweight linen or a glazed holland, and this is what I'm cutting here. And then, of course, the pockets themselves are lined in blue silk taffeta. Now, along with tailoring throughout the 18th century, it's all about economy and about laying your pattern pieces to make the best of the material you have. So here I have the blue silk taffeta for the linings of the front, and for the linings of the back, I simply flip it over to use up the dead space, and then the rest is made from piecing, all of the leftover pieces. and. With all those leftover pieces, I can make other little things, like handbags, reticules, and, what is rather fun, a lining for a hat. And the back reinforcing for the tail pleats are put in place using a glazed holland and pad stitched into place. This gives stability to a high stress area of the garment and helps give it a bit of body as well as secure against falling off a horse and ripping the back of your tails out. The interfacing is also carried on the front all the way down as well on the button side there is something called the button stand which is whipped into place and top stitched and this is a straight piece of linen which is then curved around to give stability for the buttons and then the lining is then sewn in using a spaced back stitch or a running stitch there doesn't seem to be much consensus during the period from garments I've examined. So it tends to be what works best with the material and the lining. In my case, I used a running back stitch. And then on the front, you can barely see the stitches anyway, using a dark blue silk thread.
Now on to sewing the sleeves of the coat in a backstitch using, once again, dark blue silk thread. And interestingly, once you get into it, sewing by hand doesn't quite take as long as you think it might. Setting in the pocket flaps is really important because you want to capture the curve of the body. The top of the pocket flap itself is curved and you need to curve that round the body in order to help give the coat shape. The pocket bags themselves are linen, and they are sewn into place. And, alright, in this particular case I did use a machine, simply because time and effort. No one's going to see this, it doesn't really add much structural help doing it by hand or by machine. The next detail to consider, and something that really helps cement these garments into a time period, is the size of the buttons. It was getting increasingly popular to have larger and larger buttons. And the button I'm going to be using is an inch and a quarter, which seems quite large, but then when you compare it to other coats of the time, it really begins to make sense. especially when looking back at the original coat. Now, the buttons are sewn onto the front of the coat using, once again, a blue silk thread. And just sewn on like that. There is, of course, another way of doing it, but I'll show you that in another video. Now we come to the britches, and in my mind, I see those britches, yes, as black, but probably not black silk velvet. After all, a morning walk, it's not necessarily a good idea. However, what is really coming into fashion at this period is the English gentleman, the country style of coat, the things associated with horse riding and sportly pursuits. This is the beginning of the classical period, so in my mind it would make sense for these britches to be a light wool, and in this case I'm using a casimir, also from Ocean Phillips, which has a wonderful sheen, and I suppose it would be understood that in portraiture or descriptions it might seem that the two might be confused.
switches themselves don't have a lot of interfacing. It's generally just the waistband and the tops of the falls and some places behind buttons. But it's using the same glaze holland as the rest of the coat. The waistband is folded over and whip stitched the interfacing. This gives the whole thing a lot more body, and after all, all of this will be covered up with a linen lining. Now coming to the waistcoat, it's particularly difficult, especially with Gainsborough's use of colour, style and shading. Now, I don't think there's much doubt that we've got a sort of golden undertone, but those stripes, definitely striped, are they blue, are they green, in some lights they look grey, so this has been a really interesting one to try and work out. Let's have a look at the fabric stash. It was tricky to decide and to work out what might work best, but I decided on this nice variegated gold and grey stripe, which I think, in retrospect, looks really good. This silk had been in storage for a wee while, so I thought it best to give it a nice press, get rid of some of those creases before then moving on to putting it together. Now here I am sharpening my chalk, which is particularly useful when it comes to a light silk. A nice sharp chalk prevents less drag on a piece of cloth and it's less likely to move around. Normally when cutting out a garment, I would double over the fabric, but with the lightness of this particular silk and the weight of it, as well as the design, I wanted to keep it completely uniform, so I cut them out separately, both fronts, and this made it a lot easier. There is interfacing down the front and the collar, once again also giving a button stand as with the coat, similar construction. The linings for the waistcoat are of course from linen. Linen was often used for linings and back pieces of clothing of the period, but you also have other materials such as light wools and fustians. I do love to pattern match, and of course it's even more fun when you can almost entirely hide the pocket. And the front, of course, has lovely gold buttonholes. Now the real finisher to the outfit is, of course, the hat. And I'm not a hatter, I don't know what I'm doing. So I turn to a good friend, Paul Ventress, who I will link below, who does the most astonishing work. Here he is pressing and steaming the felt, which to me is absolute magic. I opted for using some spare silk I had lying around and decided to do a nice hot pink lining. Now, coloured linings for hats were indeed a thing. Adds a little bit of individualism to a garment. And there you have it. A morning walk. Back into 1785. Thanks for watching, everyone. Oh, good. I stopped recording when you did that. Do it one more time. Do it one more time. <laughs> <laughs>